So don't overplay on the fourth. I think that's something that I've done a little and it's kind of, uh, it's interesting because you do want to put a lot of pressure on fourths and you want to hit fourths hard off of high drops or even just average drops. But if somebody hits a great drive at you, you've got to kind of be able to flip that switch and just say, okay, come on into the kitchen, let's dig. Okay, so we are back with another episode of the James Ignatowicz Show. I'm excited to talk about this topic because this is one of my favorite topics um, because it actually pertains a lot to what has made me improve so much in 2023, um, just with mixed doubles and a little bit with men's doubles, but mostly with mixed, which is hitting the big serve and then hitting the dipping low drive. Uh, Zane Navratil kind of talks about it like a drive drop. I think he, he calls it the drip shot because it's a hybrid between a drive and a drop. So this shot is not just important in mixed. I think it's more important in mixed doubles than it is in men's doubles or women's doubles. But overall, it is something that is hugely important, especially if you're somebody who struggles to get to the kitchen a little bit and doesn't necessarily trust your resets or your drops because I'm somebody who falls into that category or maybe a little less so now, but I used to be somebody who had almost no confidence in the third shot drop and not a lot of confidence in the fifths and the sevenths and the ninths. Any of the resetting was not my forte. So I had a couple options. It was either get really good at hitting drops and really good at resets, which is something that I have tried to do all year. I spent about an hour a day on it and I still am trying to improve at it and I think I have improved at it. Or I could just get good at ripping the serve and then ripping a low dipping drive so that teams wouldn't want to return to me in the first place. Because in all of my partnerships, whether it was with Tyson last year and Anna last year or Matt this year and Anna this year, everyone is returning to me. And I like to believe that it's because they're afraid of my crashing ability, they, they want to keep me back. But I know it's a combination of the fact that I have been a little shaky on my drops and on my resets in the past. And ultimately, returning to me was the best strategy in a lot of ways. So my plan was, you know what, I'm just gonna rip the serve as hard as I basically can, and then I'm gonna hit a drive low and dipping to the player who has just returned my serve and who is coming in. So this shot is very important. I think that if you are a big server or somebody who is capable of hitting a big serve, it becomes more important because that person who returned your serve will be making contact with their fourth or with your third shot drive at maybe halfway between the kitchen line and the baseline. And as you go down and level, you'll find that the frequency at which people are able to go from their baseline to the kitchen in a fast way actually diminishes. You know, I look at the four O's and the four fives of the world, even five O's, they're not always in a, you know, they're not always hustling to the kitchen line, they're not always moving as fast as they could to the kitchen line. And the way to take advantage of that is a big serve and then a low dipping drive. So people think big serve, big drive. You know, they crush the serve and then they want to crush the drive and hit it, you know, take a big cut on the ball, hit it almost flat, maybe with a little top spin and hit it close to as hard as they can, or at least hard as they can feel comfortable making it in most of the time. That's actually not the case. I think that's the mentality on the serve. So on the serve, you should be hitting it, for me at least, I'm hitting it as hard as I can, as long as I'm comfortable making nine out of 10 of them. And if I miss, one out of 10 serves, I'm happy about it, I'm totally okay with it, and if I make 10 in a row, or if I make 15 in a row, that means I'm not going for enough, and I'm gonna try to actively start to try to actually miss one, and hit it, as, hit it harder and harder and harder until I do miss one or two. But with the drive, it's not the case. The, the drive and the serve are entirely different shots, and when you hit the drive, especially off of a big serve, the goal should be for it to bounce maybe even four feet behind the kitchen line. You know, it's a drive that is hit with, you know, maybe this much margin over the net, a lot of topspin, and you know, I wouldn't say topspin is the most important factor here. I think the most important thing is just getting some topspin, having it be within five or six inches of the height of the net, and then bouncing four feet or five feet behind the kitchen line. That drive is way better and way more effective across all events then is a drive that is crushed and is gonna be bouncing maybe a foot from the baseline. 
So it's kind of counterintuitive because you think, well, I want to hit the drive as hard as I can. You know, the point of the drive is you want to crush it just like the serve. No, not the case. You want to crush the serve deep, and then as they're coming forward, you hit a low dipping drive that you're hoping will actually make contact with their feet or their ankles by the time they're coming in. You want to meet them on the way in. And if you hit a harder drive at somebody, they're able to make contact with the ball around maybe the height of their hips or maybe even their chest if you miss hit it. And that is an infinitely easier fourth shot to hit than one that is dipping and you're gonna hit it at the height of your ankles while you're coming in because those are the drives that create pop ups. And that was a big thing for me because, you know, I actually I noticed this a lot, especially with tennis players that are coming in, they're trying to hit their drives way too hard. They're taking big cuts on these drives and ultimately they're not doing themselves any favors and they're actually missing some drives long. And that would bring me to this next point. You should never miss a drive long. I've already spoken about this, so I'm gonna keep it quick. If you miss a drive long, your head is in the wrong place, okay? If you miss a drive in the net, maybe the top of the net tape, one out of 10 or 15 times, that's not really that big of a deal that shows that you're trying to do the right thing. But if you miss a drive long, you are you know, 10 feet past your target. Your target should be five feet past the kitchen line, uh, especially, if you're playing doubles, I mean, if you're playing singles and you want to drive it hard down the line and it goes right on the baseline, that's one thing. But if you're playing doubles and you're trying to get it to the feet of the person who's coming in off your return, the best drive is hit four or five feet behind the kitchen line. It's nothing deeper than that. It's nothing harder than that. And ultimately for me, these drives that I'm hitting are at 60%, maybe 70% of my full pace. So I'll leave it at that. We've spoken about that before. And I think a topic that we haven't spoken about yet, which I'll get into now, is how do we defend against somebody who's hitting a really hard serve and then a dipping drive? And that's something that's actually getting a lot more prevalent because people are getting better at serving and they're getting better at driving. Hopefully because they're listening to my podcast, I would think I've been encouraging people to crush the serve and the drive for a long time, but also because of the paddles. You know, the paddle technology is changing every day and it's getting so much better that getting, you know, imparting a lot of power and topspin on the ball has never been easier. And I've got a feeling it's going to get easier and easier and easier as we move forward into pickleball. So the answer to this question is either hitting a hard return, which is something that you can do if you feel comfortable doing it. If somebody crushes a serve at you, it's not easy to hit a hard return back. What I found easier is going cross court high. I go high cross court because on that return, there's so much more space for the ball to travel and just length of time in the air. And Colin John spoke about this recently. There's more distance if you go from one back corner to another back corner just because of the geometry of the court. There's, I think it's like seven extra feet than if you were to just go directly down the line. There's more distance. And if you get height on that ball, you're gonna have a lot more time to get in because they have to let that ball bounce. Ultimately, it's the two bounce rule. The first thing you learn in pickleball, obviously. And if they have to let that ball bounce, if you put six or seven feet of height over the net on that ball, it's pretty easy to get to the kitchen line uh, by the time they're even making contact with that drive. So that's what I do. I'm not going to go down the line. That's the key here because if, and it, and if you have to go down the line, let's say that the person on the left is crushing the drive and the person on the right isn't, then you can. But if both players are driving well, I would always go cross court with that ball and I'd always put some loft on it because if there is loft on the return, it might be easier to hit a dipping drive. That's one thing because they're making contact at the height of their hips or maybe higher but I think it's worth it because for the ball to travel that far with that much height on it, you're gonna have time to get right up there and it's gonna make it way easier for you to hit the fourth. So this is all very important. And I think one thing that helped me a lot returning hard serves is just making a wider base on my return. I think if you're standing up straight and the return is com serve is coming hard at you, it's a lot tougher to hit it mainly because a hard serve is gonna bounce lower for the most part because it's the most linear shot in pickleball because you're going from one baseline to another baseline. It's going all the way in that direction and it's probably not gonna bounce that high if somebody's really crushing it. So you have to get low. You have to make an athletic wide base when you're returning those balls. So that's one thing and another reason why you wanna get loft on the return is not only because you can give yourself time to get up there, especially if you're unwinding a stack, <clears throat> but they have to create their own power. They're not able to really use your power as much on their drive, because if you hit a ball hard at somebody, then your power is also their power. It's like if you were to hit a ball against a wall, 
it's going to come back harder if you hit it harder. That's how it works. And if you get a lot of loft and you don't really give them a lot of power to work with, they have to generate all the power themselves. And a lot of people have a tough time with that unless they're using a you know, 002 or a Power Air, some sort of great Selkirk paddle. But if they're not, um, it gets difficult to create that much power on your own. So those are the main things. Um, one thing also that I found that's helped me is I'm not really trying to crush the fourth off of a low dipping drive. For the most part, I'm just keeping my paddle out in front and I'm kind of just trying to get it down because usually if somebody hits a well-executed dipping drive third, their partner's crashing. And if their partner's crashing, well, you have two options. One option is to go hard right at them. And I've actually had some success with that. If you go hard right at somebody who's crashing, a lot of their momentum is going forward and it might send their fifth out. So you can do that once in a blue moon unless they're really ready for it, then they'll adjust to it. But if somebody's crashing with a lot of success, you can consider instead of trying to find that open space, just as they're moving forward, go right at them and then be ready to leave that next one because that next one is probably going out unless they get it right down. But for the, for the most part, I've found that that fifth off of a crash, if it's hit down right at the person, is going out. The other option you have off a really good drive is just kind of go short middle. Just kind of relinquish control of the kitchen um, or relinquish the kitchen itself. If they hit a really good serve and a really good drive, I think it's, it's, it's just more safe to just make it bounce in the middle, maybe go cross because Ultimately, for the most part, if that's a 50-50 play for you, if you just say, okay, come into the kitchen, whatever, every time they hit a really good drive, then you'll be winning most of those points because they're going to miss some of their drives. You know, it's impossible to make every drive. If you're driving an inch over the net, it's, it's a little risky. I mean, that's one of the, the downfalls of having a huge serve and drive is that you are going to miss some serves and you are going to miss some drives. So don't overplay on the fourth, I think. That's something that I've done a little and it's kind of, uh, it's interesting because you do want to put a lot of pressure on fourths and you want to hit fourths hard off of high drops or even just average drops. But if somebody hits a great drive at you, you've got to kind of be able to flip that switch and just say, okay, come on into the kitchen, let's dink. So those would be the main things for me. And I think that one thing that's overlooked and I think a lot of mistakes happen on this shot is, or this situation, is when people are unwinding the stack off of big serves and drives when they don't necessarily have to. It's a pretty simple calculation, and I think you should look at it like this. It's how many points are we losing because we're not stacking versus how many points are we losing because we are unwinding the stack and the person coming all the way across is getting caught in transition on their fourth. If you're losing more points because somebody's getting caught in transition on their fourth, which my personal opinion is that's happening a lot more often than people, especially at the 5.0 and 4.5 level where stacking is maybe important, but probably not as essentially as important as if Ben and Colin ended up with Ben on the right. You know, that's, that's a bigger deal than two guys that are like, ah, one of us likes the left better, one of us doesn't. We're going to stack every single time, and then one of us is going to get caught unwinding the stack every third receiving point. I don't think that's as efficient. So if you're getting caught on unwinding the stack a lot, just don't unwind. Just half stack, stack on your serve, and don't stack when you're returning. I don't think that sort of rigidity as it relates to unwinding a stack every single time is worth it. And ultimately, if you're giving your opponent different looks, you know, one guy's on the left every time you're serving and then you never unwind the stack, there's also some benefit to be had in that too. Getting them out of the patterns, doing different things on the return, it's all good. So. Those are the main things, um, and we're just going to end the podcast right here. I mean, all efficiency. Three straight topics, and we're done. So thank you for watching, guys. That's all we got.